Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to talk today about the melting pot of American food culture. Um, I am from Suzy, and we are doing this in partnership with New Hope Network. So thanks again for everyone who has joined us. Just really quickly, a little about Suzy. So we are an end-to-end -end consumer research platform. We help all different types of companies in all different industries and groups make faster consumer-centric decisions. Uh, we have qualitative, quantitative, um, and our own panel uh, all in one platform at C. And we help customers with one-off questions to robust surveys. I'm really giving everyone in the B2B, uh, B2C space, um, the ability to talk to consumers quickly um, and get the insights that they need, especially in this ever-changing landscape. So a quick background of this study. Um, this was conducted at the end of May with a sample size of 1,000 Americans. And the sample that uh, we use is census weighted. So as I mentioned, um, I am from Suzy. I am the SVP of marketing, um, and we are here joined today by Eric Pierce. I'm gonna let him introduce himself um, and give you guys some background on where he comes from. Fabulous. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm delighted you've chosen to spend a little bit of time with uh, Melissa and I. We're really excited to share this research. We've got a, a lot of really interesting insights and couple of really important considerations to share with you today. As Melinda, Melissa mentioned, I'm Eric Pierce, Vice President of Business Insights for New Hope and Informa. What that means is that I'm responsible for our uh, Marketplace Insights teams, both the Nutrition Business Journal and Next Data and Insights here at New Hope. My team and I see it as our uh, role to help drive responsible growth of the natural organic products industry, and we do so by making giving the marketplace a voice using research like this and presentations and content that we create like this to help inform decision making across the industry. Ultimately, our goal is the same as New Hope's mission, and we hope that data can help to cultivate a prosperous, high integrity CPG and retail ecosystem that creates health, joy, and justice for all people while regenerating the planet. Um, with that, we're going to do a little bit of that today, I hope. Uh, and Melissa, maybe I'll give it back to you. And thank you again for letting me join you on this. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Eric. We work with, as I mentioned, a number of different industries, food and beverage, CPG, finance, um, all sorts of categories. And really, the work that we do on our platform helps inform um, customer decisions in every part of the product development life cycle. So we're really excited to bring this research to you today. Um, it's pretty exciting and we've gotten some very cool trends that we're starting to see in it. So with that, we are going to dive in. Um, so culture can mean different things to different people um, from beliefs to social norms, society associates with culture with a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, so what we found is that 56% say that culture refers to nationality. Um, this was both a quant and qual study. So some of the quotes that we got through qual were, um, you know, your nationality determines your cultural identity because you usually assimil assimilate to the culture of the country that you actually live in. 43% of who we surveyed say that culture refers to ethnicity. So this figure actually rises to 71% among those who identify as Asian. And 54% say that culture re refers to personal identity. So someone said the culture that I identify with is the culture of the 70s and 80s growing up in the South. So what ties in many of these cultural identifiers? Food. Um, food is obviously an amazing thing that brings people together. So um, we are going to talk a lot about that in this webinar. 84% um, say that food has the power to connect people of different cultures and backgrounds. And if you think of the expression to break bread with someone, this is actually referring to the way that food brings people together. Um, and it's really important in relationships. Um, there's a famous anthropologist named Margaret Mead who wrote about how food is for gifting. And what Mead meant by this is that the food provides us with something more symbolic than simply nutrition, though that's certainly important. 
Um, food is meant to be exchanged and shared with family and friends. So we are gonna dive into three different uh, topics within this webinar. The first is around the role that culture plays in consumers' food choices. The second is how people are actually shopping for their own cultural foods. And finally, uh, how people are shopping for foods from other cultures. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Eric, who is going to run through this first topic. Fabulous. Thanks for giving us the overview of our three sections. Um, in our first section, let's explore what role does culture play in consumer food choices. Um, in each of these sections, we're going to share with you an insight, a so what, and a watch out. Actually, the watch out is a really important topic that we want to include in this broader discussion of culture. More on that in just a minute. But our insight that shapes this first section of our conversation today um, is that people are more likely to enjoy food if it is tied to their sense of identity. There are a number of reasons why people want to eat food from their culture. 48% say it reminds them of their childhood. 47% say that it helps them connect with family. And another 37% say that it allows them to keep in touch with their own identity um, or that side of their identity. But interestingly, while these emotional reasons are really important to why people want to eat food from their culture, they're not the main reasons. Um, Maybe it's not surprising. This is really quite similar to a lot of what we see in here when we do research about what drives consumer food choices. But we see that taste and flavor are actually the top two motivators behind why people choose food from their cultures. For them, it's simply what uh, tastes good and what flavors are satisfying to them. These are the tastes and flavors that people are, are most familiar with. Maybe. So when thinking about food and culture, taste and identity are important. But what's really interesting is that these two things that are obviously connected may actually be more connected uh, than we realize. And there's research to support this. There was a series of studies that found that social identity shapes the evaluation of food pleasantness, how much you enjoy it. For example, in one experiment, Southerners here in the United States were reminded of their Southernness. Um, and in doing so, their perceptions of the tastiness of Southern food was higher when they were first reminded of, of their cultural orientation to the South. In another really interesting study, Canadian test subjects only preferred the taste of maple syrup, a Canadian staple, if you will, over honey, right? So Canadians only preferred the taste of maple syrup over honey when they were first reminded of their Canadian identities. Um, so what this study essentially reveals is that food actually tastes better when you're reminded of the culture, of your culture, before eating it. So what? Context is important. Food can help one connect with family, with memories, with parts of one's identity, but the context for one's culture can also enhance their experience of food. It seems like a positive feedback loop exists between these two things. Uh, people use food to remain connected to culture and identity, and being reminded of one's culture and identity enhances their enjoyment of the food and therefore reinforces that sort of feedback loop. So what does this mean? Consider marketing food products around a relevant identity. It seems that making, making and marketing food that is culturally authentic and meaningfully connected to the culture it is from may not only invite adventurous flavor seekers from outside their cult the culture, but it might also help engage and activate the identities of those eating foods from their own cultures. One example of marketing of food around a relevant identity is this brand here, African Dream. Um, African Dream leans heavily into an African identity exhibited in the name, the animals on the bottles here, the flavors of the hot sauces. They celebrate broadly a connection to Africa. The founders tell a story of their passions for travel, for food, for hot sauces, and the spices of Africa and animal photography, and along with that, wildlife conservations. Uh, they make prominent their donations to wildlife protection organizations actively fighting to protect endangered uh, animals across the African continent. Their African dream is to bring, and this is how they state it on their website, bring these amazing flavors of natural wholesome foods from Africa to the world while establishing a positive impact on local communities and wildlife. So here there appears to be an authentic connection between the brand and its sustainability goals that ties different elements of the brand together and how it connects to consumers, uh, how it connects consumers to their brand story and their reason for being. So kind of reinforcing this idea of culture and everything else. 
And I'll maybe just kind of caveat cautiously that, that Africa is not necessarily a culture. Of course, it's a continent and on it, there are a lot of different cultures and, and countries, but there is still just an idea of tying these things together that may be connecting and resonating with some. We'll actually caveat just a little bit more about that in a second when we talk about our watch outs. Another example of marketing food to a cultural identity is buckwood, uh, maple syrup. This is a product sold in the UK and Ireland. Um, and while they could lean into their, the taste of their product, the fact that it's organic or pure or natural, their branding actually leads with their Canadian identity. Um, if you look at their website, if you look at their social media, you see just this idea of maple leaves and red in Canada as prominent throughout. As a little bit of a transition to the next topic we're going to talk about here, the watchouts, I do, however, want to point out that the connection here to identity may be a little bit of a tricky one. In this piece of marketing that you're seeing on this page, we start to see some of that. The product is owned by a company called uh, named Vallejo Foods. They're an Irish business with 50 food brands sold across 90 countries. And their story for this particular brand and product makes a brief reference to the first people of the land that is now known as Canada. Uh, the, they also derive the brand name, uh, Buckwood, from the Algonquin people's name for maple syrup. Uh, Sinzi buckwood, meaning drawn from wood. But I was unable to find any meaningful connection between Vallejo Foods and the Algonquin people. The product is sourced from Canada. The product is pure maple syrup. From that respect, they're connecting to a cultural identity for sure. But I don't know if this is a good example of an authentic connection to identity that is central to the brand story, or maybe a risky edge case uh, that might be an example of cultural appropriation. So that's actually what we want to talk about in our watch outs today. Uh, since we're talking about culture, we think this topic's really important, and Melissa and I want to make sure that we help you out and draw some attention to the uh, topic of cultural appropriation um, and the importance of paying attention to this fairly tricky topic um, when one explores the commercialization of identity and cultural foods. So in this section, we talked about the value of connecting to an identity in delivering a rich experience for consumers. In our examples, we saw different examples of how brands are doing this. But I'm not entirely sure either brand is navigating the challenging space of cultural identity authentically uh, or with uh, authenticity, uh, with cultural integrity. And they might actually be borderline on that cultural appropriation space. Um, just so that everyone kind of is familiar, if this isn't something you've thought much about or had a chance to explore, cultural appropriation is defined as the unacknowledged or inappropriate ad uh, adoption of customs, practices, ideas, et cetera, of one people or society by members of another people or our society. And typically, when it's being adopted inappropriately or in an unacknowledged way by the more dominant people or society. So while our insight for this section is that engaging a relevant identity can help in creating a good product experience, our watch out for you in this section is to ensure that you are engaged, that you're going to engage, if you're going to engage a cultural identity for commercial gain, that you ensure you have uh, an authentic connection to the culture and that your work is benefiting um, that culture and not exploiting it. Um, I wanna give you an example of that recently. Um, I would add that, I would also add that if you're coming to this topic of exploring culture and the intersection of culture and food from a position of privilege or power, this is a space you have to go into kind of carefully and make sure that you're doing it right. One recent example of the risk of cultural appropriation that you may have seen in the news recently is that Walmart recently received critical feedback for its Juneteenth themed ice cream, which some critics labeled as the epitome of white supremacy in action, right? That's not how you want to be seen by a brand, but that is how this particular one was seen by some people in the community. Twitter users complained about Walmart, Walmart using Juneteenth to make money without other action, without engaging or supporting black employees or communities. Now, I don't know what's going on at Walmart. I don't know what engagement they do or don't have, but this is a good example of the risk of looking like you're, you're appropriating a culture inappropriately. So um, a perspective to, to have in mind here is, is one that was written by Ryan Pintado Berkner from Smoketown Strategy. It's one that I think is really useful. He is, of course, in this particular LinkedIn post, um, exploring directly the connection between this product and the black community and, and exploitation or appropriation of that community. I would encourage you to read his entire post. I, we've just summarized a little bit of it here, 
Um, get to know Ryan, get to know their business, uh, read this post in full. Um, but what I want to do is call out three questions that he asked in his analysis of this Juneteenth Walmart ice cream situation that I think are good questions that can be adapted to any exploration of, is my effort to connect food to a culture that isn't mine potentially at risk of cultural appropriation? He asked, will black people as a community be better off in tangible ways if your brand's initiatives, initiative is successful? He asks you to consider, does your brand initiative help black entrepreneurs, activists, or change agents um, build power or wealth? If the answer is no, or you're not sure, you might be borderline or you might be deep into the cultural appropriation space. And the third question he asked people to consider, is there a relevant linkage between the issue you support, your brand's equity, and the customer or the consumer that your brand serves? Um, Melissa, I think we'll come back to these three questions uh, in her section as well, but I really would love for people to, to think about these as a framework and a way for assessing assessing the risk of cultural appropriation in this space. Um, for now, let me hand it back to Melissa for our next section. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so next we're going to talk about how people shop for foods um, the, of the culture that they actually identify with. So our insight number two, the big insight here that we uncovered is that it's not an accessibility issue as much as some people just struggle with cooking foods from their own culture. So 73% of people that we surveyed say they can easily find the cultural food products in the grocery stores. Um, these numbers were actually a bit surprising to us. Um, they were, seem pretty high as far as mass retailers and grocery stores being able uh, to basically provide cultural foods. I think, you know, for a long time, specialty stores have been a destination for cultural products, yet mass retailers and grocery stores have really made a concerted effort to bring cultural foods into their stores um, and, and really provide a diverse um, sort of range of tastes. Um, and with that, you know, Costco is actually a really good example of their winning favor amongst Asian Americans for stocking items such as such as Duran, which was previously hard to come by in mainstream grocery stores, but they've gotten press um, that this is actually a place and a destination um, that Asian American families are going to. Um, 51 percent that they say there is nothing that prevents them from eating their cultural foods. Um, but I think a brand lesson as we look at this is um, there is 49 percent that actually feel otherwise. So it's it's basically half. Um, most people are saying that they're willing to put in the time to make the food they love. Um, however, 17 percent from our survey are actually saying that costs prevent them from purchasing ingredients that they need. Um, and as a, we think about inflation and what's happening from a supply chain and an economy issue, um, I wonder if you know, that may become even more cost prohibitive. Um, but you know, with this data, 22% said the recipes are too time consuming and 18% said, I can't cook them as well as my family did growing up. So people wanna make want easier ways to enjoy their cultural food at home, but authenticity is definitely still a top priority. 45% um, say that authenticity is important when shopping for foods from their own culture. And while they may save time in the kitchen, we're actually seeing a rise in sort of ready-made versions of cultural foods, um, but they've come under fire for being inauthentic. Um, so we have a few examples here. So a so-called Vietnamese pho, um, which you know, in in this in the Netherlands, it included um, chicken thighs. While the ingredients is typically authentic pho is sliced beef or chicken, um, and there was yellow noodles that were added as a supplement for rice noodles. Um, and, you know, what came out from these Vietnamese customers was saying that the supermarket really needs to have a responsibility to sell real pho and that they can't mix the ingredients together and call it pho. So I think while, you know, obviously marketing, um, you know, is a way of positioning things, the real 
ingredients and authenticity to a culture, you know, is bar none most important, especially in this instance. Um, so what do we take away from this? So I think helping consumers enjoy cultural foods at home is really important. However, with that said, having a compromise on convenience and authenticity is really, um, I think, you know, something that brands need to take a close look at. Um, the authenticity really is the thing that matters most. Um, so how can brands actually, you know, be authentic in this space? Um, we have a few really great examples. Omsom was founded by two sisters, Vanessa and Kim Pham, um, who are daughters of Vietnamese refugees. So it's described as real Asian flavors that take you home. And they created these starter kits as a way to bring proud, loud Asian flavors to your fingertips any day of the week. No more diluted dishes, no more cultural compromise, real deal Asian culture and cuisine that communities are too damn delicious to deny. So um, they've been really loud and proud about this. And they have spent, I think, a lot of time and effort making sure this actually feels the way that they knew it to be when growing up. Um, this is obviously a smaller brand, but another one that's really notable um, from a much bigger brand is Nestle. They've created these Middle Eastern range Mez East, um, which fe features convenient meal kits that can be made in under 30 minutes. Um, the range was actually created by Middle Eastern chefs that Nestle partnered with. Um, and there's selected ingredients sourced directly from the Middle East to really ensure this authenticity um, and that culture and convenience can be done. But the, you know, the key to collaborate is really around making sure the culture is infused. And so I think this is an example of obviously a big brand that really spent the time researching and, and doing what they needed to um, from a development perspective and a product innovation perspective to make sure that this was connecting with their culture in the right way. Um, and then as far as watch outs, um, you know, you just have to make sure that it's not just about the flavors that are authentic, but also your commitment to the community as well. Um, some of the questions Eric posed um, previously around the ice cream, I think, you know, bring up, is there a real connection for the brand um, to the community and, and making sure you sort of think about that in development. Obviously, you know, your audience is important, but that connectivity, um, I think, stands first and foremost. Um, so Eric touched on it, but Ben and Jerry's is actually um, a brand that's known to have supported and uplifted the black community for many years. Um, so I think, you know, as they have spent a lot of time, um, you know, really working on this, this is a, you know, a community and a brand that feels connected in the right way versus, you know, obviously what we saw in the Walmart example. Um, they've influenced policy on criminal justice reform. They've donated profits to activists, nonprofits, um, and they really sort of taken a stand, um, not just in voice, but in action. Um, and, and that is a really, I think, important part, especially as brands think about how are they going to connect with consumers and audiences in an authentic way. So with that, um, I am going to hand it back over to Eric for this final section. Fabulous. Thanks, Melissa. Um, all right, moving on to our third section. Let's explore answers to the question, how are people shopping uh, for food from other cultures? Uh, the insight for this section is that people no longer feel the need to make the distinction between ethnic and non-ethnic food. We're going to explore what that means at the grocery store and, and again, what it means for how people are shopping. Uh, according to Grandview Research, the ethnic food market is growing. In fact, uh, the global ethnic food market was valued at U.S. Uh, $39.5 billion in 2021, according to Grandview, and it's expected to continue to grow at a compound annual rate of about 8.9% between 2022 and 2028. But what does the term ethnic really mean? And is it a term that still resonates? Uh, actually, a lot of people feel the term ethnic should probably not be applied to food at all. And the point from this Washington Post article is that ethnic 
uh, is too much of a blanket term. Talking about ethnic food itself is unhelpful as it, as it groups dozens of cuisines into a generic label. Whether you're eating Thai, Ethiopian, Tibetan, or Chilean food, you should celebrate the specific cultures that these foods and cuisines come from rather than the generic label of ethnic. Um, and what's interesting is that the label ethnic is something that people associate with other cultures more than their own. The data points on this page are actually probably more a reflection of demographic issues than anything else. But we do see that about 43% of consumers say they go to the ethnic aisle to find food from other cultures, while 23% say that they go to the aisle to find food from their own cultures. I think that 23% is important, almost a quarter, right? So I think the risk of continuing to label an aisle in the grocery store as the ethnic aisle is that of continuing to make our customers, the people in our stores, the people buying our brands, the risk of having that ethnic aisle in the grocery store is making someone feel other than or different from. And I'd ask you to think about a quarter of the population shopping for their own cultures from these stores. Is that the experience that we want to create? other than or different from, either passively or actively for our customers. And I do know that some supermarket chains are beginning to change um, how they describe that aisle, but there might be an argument to go even further than changing its name, but at very least considering changing the name. Um, reinforcing this need for change, we asked consumers about the ethnic aisle in the grocery store, and one in three, so about 33%, said that they wish the ethnic aisle were bigger to better reflect uh, the variety of foods from all of these different cultures, um, as opposed to having a relatively small space uh, where, where they find those. And about one in five say that they would just get rid of the ethnic food aisle altogether and mix in all the food from that aisle in with the rest of the grocery store um, options instead. So I think the issue here is how do we best reflect who our shoppers are, what they want to buy, where they want to buy it, and to begin to recognize that, again, having this sort of segregated part of the grocery store, it means less and less uh, to the market today. In an article from the Business Insider, they talk about the idea of, of millennial, I think, I think we've said that millennials have killed just about everything that came from Gen X or Boomer Age. But anyways, millennials are killing the ethnic aisle uh, is, is the headline here. Uh, but they also found, more importantly, that industry experts seem to be agreeing with this. They point out that as mainstream Americans tastes shift um, and become more diverse and inclusive, the ethnic aisle is really becoming outdated, just like the term ethnic. Um, ethnic feels like, like oriental today. It feels like a term we probably almost shouldn't even be using anymore. Um, the challenge for brands that are relegated to the ethnic aisle is that they end up competing for a relatively small amount of shelf space. I think we should ask ourselves, would brands, retailers, and consumers in retail be better off if salsa was competing with other condiments for shelf space rather than competing in the ethnic aisle for things like for shelf space versus things like rice noodles or curry paste, right? We should really having like items competing with like items to say, what are consumers buying? What do they want? And how do we drive shelf space decisions based on this more holistic view of what consumers want to be bringing into their houses? The difficult reality for grocery stores um, is that this relative lack of diversity that kind of comes maybe from making this limited set of self shelf uh, allocation decisions based on the ethnic aisle is that it seems to be driving less diversity that is driving consumers in some cases to specialty retail. Um, it, it is clear that consumers today are looking beyond the ethnic aisle to get their needs met. One in three consumers reported telling us uh, that they report shopping specialty stores like Asian supermarkets in order to buy food from other cultures. An example here is H Mart, the American Korean grocery store chain that has become one of the fastest growing retailers in the US. And this is attributed not just to people from Asian countries or cultures shopping here, but also from appeal to America's fast growing multicultural population and also from consumers from other cultures who are going there to shop and explore what's on the shelf and what's on offer. Another interesting thing is that products that were previously seen as ethnic are increasingly becoming mainstream or trendy. They're being incorporated into our lives in ways beyond it being uh, an ethnic cuisine or an alternative cuisine or food. 
Um, this example isn't new to most of us on the call here, but one example of this is jackfruit, which had been a staple in the South Asian cuisine for a very long time, but recently became fairly trendy uh, more domestically here in vegan diets as a meat alternative because of the texture that it provides uh, and, and just not new uses for our culture, at least in terms of how that product is being used. So the so what here is that, especially for brands that are considered ethnic, is to really push outside the boundaries that might be defining where ethnic food shows up today. Ethnic food products shouldn't be kept in a box. The fact that they are coming from other cultures shouldn't confine where they are in the store or what types of recipes they're used in. Um, they can be used across all different types of cuisines and increasingly consumers are probably wanting to find these products integrated into their lives as well as into the broader grocery set. One example of this um, is Red Boat Vietnamese fish sauce. Um, on their website, they feature a large number of, or a relatively large number of recipes on their website uh, that include several product applications that are well outside of where one might expect to find the cultural use of fish sauce, like in recipes for chicken wings and in recipes for scotch eggs. While it's important to be sensitive when blending different cuisines and cultures, a condiment such as fish sauce can play a role in cooking food from different cuisines and it doesn't have to be strictly tied to the culture that it belongs in. A good example of this is olive oil. Olive oil is Mediterranean. For a long time, it was a Mediterranean specialty ingredient, but today it's a regular cooking staple for many people. We learned how to cook with these ingredients. They became kitchen staples, and maybe the same is becoming true or will become true of ingredients that are newer to us today. Another example of this comes from Brooklyn Deli. Uh, note the spelling of Delhi. This is a female-owned Brooklyn-based Indian food company. Uh, they're very proud of their Indian heritage. Um, and our first so what in this, uh, the very first chapter or section of the conversation today, um, was around marketing a product in line with a specific identity. But that identity, again, doesn't have to keep your brand or your business in a box. Brooklyn Delhi, while they really lean into their Indian heritage and celebrate that, they also feature a number of recipes on their website that aren't Indian based, but taste great with the addition of their products. This is a great example of leaning into an identity, but not being put in a box because of it. Our watch out here is designed to help you ensure that you don't unknowingly step into the realm of cultural appropriation again. To be sensitive, so the watch out is be sensitive to people's cultures when combining foods from different cuisines. An example uh, of, a, of a company that may have gotten it wrong is here on the page. This is British supermarket Marks and Spencers, who uh, were accused of a cultural appropriation after launching their sweet potato burini wrap. Um, note they misspelled burini. Um, but the misstep here may have been the appropriation and misuse of the name of a dish that could, be lead, that could lead to the dilution of the meaning of that name. Uh, the dish itself, by definition, is a rice and meat based dish uh, that many agree is being misused in describing this sweet potato wrap. It's not just a flavor combination. It's not just an herb mix or a sauce. It is really the, by nature a dish of its own that is not currently or accurately being used to describe this potato wrap. In this case, Barini um, is appropriation because its use inaccurately changes the meaning of a culturally meaningful dish and culturally defined dish. So while it's important for brands to push the boundaries on how and where ethnic food shows up, it's not a free for all. And brands need to be very sensitive to people's cultures when combining foods from different cultures. Using Vietnamese fish sauce to season chicken wings or uh, an Indian archar in a pasta dish are great examples of pushing the boundaries done right. Um, you can enhance dishes with traditional products that traditionally come from one cuisine while enhancing it while enhancing the dish overall, but without changing or inappropriately using or changing the meaning of a term. So that's kind of our watch out for this last one. I'll hand it back to you, Melissa, to start us on our conclusions. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we are going to move into the conclusion section. Um, and just to recap our three different sections. So the first was around the role that culture plays in consumers' food choices. So I think what we really, you know, sort of identified here is how important authenticity is, really staying true to your brand, developing products that have a meaning and purpose, 
if it is actually tied to a cultural identity, um, making sure that you you know don't appropriate identities that your brand has no real connection to, um, and and finding a connection that actually makes sense um, based on who you are and based on who your audience is. Great. And in our second uh, section, Melissa spoke about how consumers are shopping for food products from their own culture. Our insight was people don't have trouble finding their uh, finding their cultural food. They are having some trouble cooking them. So the so what for this section was help consumers enjoy their cultural foods at home without having to compromise on convenience or authenticity. The watch out again is make sure um, that uh, not just the flavors are authentic, but your commitment to the community as well. And then last but not least um, was how consumers are shopping for food products from other cultures. So being sensitive to other people's cultures, but also you know, being able to push the boundaries when it comes to shelf placement. You know, people are actually looking from food for food from other cultures beyond the ethnic aisle. And so I also wonder if, you know, are there other ways and opportunities for brands to think about, you know, e-com platforms or direct to consumer um, that really gives people the, you know, the food they want and the flavors they want in a more convenient way. So in this section, Eric obviously talked about the insight, which is that people no longer feel the need to make the distinction between ethnic food from all other types of foods, the so what, push the boundaries on how and where ethnic food products show up. Um, and then finally, the watch out, uh, which I think is just something we need to all think about is you know being sensitive to people's cultures when combining those foods from different cuisines and making sure they do come across um, in the right manner. So with that, um, we are going to kick off some Q and A here. Yeah, great. Um, so people go ahead and drop any questions that you might have in here. We've got a couple, I think that we can get started on, but would love it if, uh, if you've got questions about any of this to, to have you guys add them in. Um, we had a challenging question, Melissa, um, where was it that I wanted to picked out? What do you think a new grocery store layout should look like and how do you get consumer shoppers uh, on board? Uh, this one's, I think this one's tough. I don't know that there's a, an, an easy answer to this one, but um, I heard, uh, I wish I could attribute it to, to who said it. I'm, I'm not remembering off the top of my head who, who said it first, but I believe it came from a panel discussion that we had at Expo West on the very topic of, of uh, food appropriation. Um, and I think that, you know, while I don't know that there's a perfect model for this just yet, I think that we could look to the organic uh, store within a store, the gluten-free sections that once existed and were a fairly prominent part of grocery stores while gluten-free was coming online as a trend and while organic sort of was important. Uh, even the natural space, you know, for, for many years uh, in the evolution of the broader natural and organic marketplace, sort of as it was becoming mainstream, there were many retail stores that were uh, in the conventional space, as an example. They were beginning to see that as a growth opportunity, recognizing that their consumers didn't know how to find those brands, but had an interest in them. They wanted to make sure that they were drawing them out and helping consumers find them. And so they created this store within a store idea that there was an aisle or a section of the store that was to get dedicated to the natural and organic products. In some ways that could be the equivalent to the ethnic aisle today where we gave people a place, a very specific place to go for specific things. But as natural and organic mainstreamed, as it became more common, the realization was actually that we should be blending these things into the regular shelf set. So some brands went through a process of moving them from that store within a store to on the same shelf set, but with shelf talkers, right? Like boundaries around the edge where they would call out organic or natural sets, uh, or they would call out the gluten-free portion of a, of a particular aisle, but you had the pastas in the pasta aisle, they were just called out. And increasingly today, I think that was kind of a stepping from the store within the store to where do you find it within the aisle to today, what you see much more of is these products sitting right next to each other 
uh, where the consumer is now educated, familiar, and understands where to look for them, but also how to compare and identify more natural products versus the more conventional ones. And so I think that we might well be able to start doing something like that with these other products where we kind of help people. I find the new location for for salsas or the new location for, for different types of seasoning sauces and ingredients um, and call them out while we put them right next to the section. And my guess is we, we only need to do that for a short period of time where we help people transition from the old way to the new way. I love that, Eric. I actually, you know, for me, um, when I think about the food aisle and what a grocery store sort of setup looks like, um, I think back to my days when I worked um, at advertising and digital marketing agencies and worked with a lot of, um, you know, sort of consumer packaged good and food and beverage uh, companies and, you know, the, the shelf placement and the whole model within a grocery store around um, placement and, you know, sort of shelf space and, and what brands pay and, and sort of what those demands are. Um, part of me wonders if, you know, there is a model that sort of gets turned on its head. Um, it feels like very mainstream brands, you know, based on how big they are, how much money they have spent, have to spend, how popular they are, they have um, an advantage, if you will, within the grocery store based on the way that um, shelf space gets distributed. And I just wonder if, you know, from a business model perspective, this is obviously a much bigger um, thing to crack and probably maybe even controversial, but I just wonder if it's not about um, you know who has more budget to spend, but if there's just a way of relooking at you know how things are organized um, versus you know just a cost being sort of the driving factor, um, and I wonder you know if that wasn't the case, uh, you know would an organization to you know group things to your point in a different way or think about you know meal based, if you will, or, you know, thinking about different ways of categorizing, I think in general, um, you know, could sort of change the game about how grocery stores and brands and especially, you know, sort of more underrepresented, you know, foods, if you will, uh, you know, get more visibility in a place, um, you know, that has a lot of product. Yeah. Yeah, there was definitely some discussion. I mean, the intersection between cultural foods and minority owned companies is an important one to consider, especially as we think about how do we bring in, you know, more diversity into our stores and represent it and the, the topics of, you know, getting and giving good placement, you know, to, to companies or individuals or businesses that, that may not have had the same set of um, uh, privileges or benefits to help them start out. I, I, it's always tricky to use the word privilege because very few people feel like they have privilege and it can be a challenging topic, especially for entrepreneurs who every single entrepreneur works hard and fights for everything that they have. Um, but, but the reality is some business types, some uh, owners have different access to, to capital, to networks, to, to businesses. And, and one of the things that we need to consider here is that intersection of how do we give lower cost or no cost and favorable shelf placement to some of these brands to help support them, um, as they work to to support our goals of bringing diversity to the shelves, um, but also our, our goals of, of creating equity um, and justice in the process as well. Uh, looking through other questions, did one jump out to you immediately, Melissa? There's a number of good ones. Um, I am going to, I'll take, do you think, so the, we got a question. Um, do you think that consumers would be more likely to choose product with good ingredients instead of looking only at the price, especially considering that we're heading into a recession? Um, and I think, you know, some of the research we've seen and even some of the topics that um, we've covered in the last few months are around sustainable foods, organic foods. I think, you know, consumers are willing to pay a premium, uh, not across the board, but I think in moments like this, um, choices have to be made. And, 
you know, if it's around gas and, you know, getting to work and getting to school, I think there's moments of, you know, good quality food um, being sacrificed. But I think for other consumers, you know, there was another question around sort of are people going to spend some more time, you know, cooking at home um, and, you know, versus going out, especially given the pandemic. And I think, you know, people, you know, having spent a lot of time at home um, and having the ability to choose good food, I think they're willing to pay the price, um, you know, for moments where, you know, they can be with family and, I think people are still very much living um, in this, you know, sort of have created habits based on the pandemic. And a lot of that is um, cooking, being together with family and friends. And I think that, you know, those good ingredients, um, you know, if that is the priority, those trickle in uh, to the home versus just looking at price. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a balance. And I think we're going to definitely see certain sacrifices being made um, and certain foods are going to probably be chosen as good over others. Um, but it's definitely, you know, it's definitely an interesting time given, you know, just the inflation costs and everything that is taking place. Um, you know, we'll run some more research and I think that would actually be a really interesting topic to compare and contrast what we saw six months ago to today and how some of those cost pieces are impacting the choices that consumers are making. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a direct parallel, but, you know, uh, our Nutrition Business Journal uh, team that does market forecasting and modeling for the size of the dietary supplement industry and has been doing that for 25 years, every time there's an economic downturn, uh, gives us another opportunity to look at what consumers actually do during economic downturns with regards to at least prioritizing their health um, and so to the question of quality ingredients versus price, one of the things that we consistently see in economic downturns is that consumers don't immediately turn away from health um, in favor of price or cost savings. Now, I don't know if this turn is going to be the same. Of course, we haven't seen inflation like we've seen like we're seeing now in decades, um, but in other economic downturns throughout the uncertainty of the pandemic and the financial pressures that many faced, we saw people investing more in their health at grocery, both in dietary supplements and in natural and organic food products um, than we have seen prior to the pandemic. And so we've seen growth in those spaces as opposed to declines. Um, I think you're right that there's gonna be more tension in the model, of course, and people will make certain trade-offs. And I wouldn't expect people to abandon um, health paradigms because of the financial pressures. Instead, consumers tend to double down on them, saying, I, I better eat well. This is loosely, I'm not saying this is exactly, exactly how consumers think about it, but the pattern seems to suggest that in economic downturns, insurance is still expensive and food is still a good way to, to manage one's health proactively and to, to keep their immune system strong and other things. And so. I'm hopeful that, that we'll continue to see a pattern like that that shows strain in the system, but not abandonment of people's values. We're seeing increasingly as well, younger consumers are, again, we are voting with their wallet. Um, I mentioned Ryan Potato Vertner earlier. He actually shared another LinkedIn post this morning that I was looking at that was continuing to reinforce, especially in this particular case, Gen Z being willing to pay more for brands uh, that are supporting cultural and environmental sort of activism. Um, and so depending on, on, on your brand and how it's positioned, consumers seem to still be voting with their wallet uh, in favor of more progressive values-based companies. So um, hopeful that continues, and I believe that it likely will. Reading through other examples. What are our thoughts? Um, I've seen some research to suggest Gen Z is more open um, to cushion cuisine due to their ethnic diversity, so there may not be the same concern about cultural appropriation uh, with dishes like um, uh, Brini ramen and sushi burritos. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, it, it, that's an interesting question. Um, if you were strictly consumer-led on the topic of cultural appropriation, um, at least in this country, we might 
mathematically be driven to continue to do things that maybe we shouldn't be. Um, and so I don't know in this particular case that I would encourage us to answer the question based on what the majority of consumers want um, or what a particular generation is comfortable with. I think that we have a responsibility as businesses in this space to, to make informed and educated decisions. And I think we can create mashup cuisines and we just need to think about how do we do it respectfully in a way um, that isn't uh, a cultural appropriation and, and one that might still create something like a sushi burrito, but find an, an appropriate way of bringing that to market where it's not, um, you know, uh, twisting the meaning of, in this particular case, sushi or burrito. I hadn't really thought about that one as cultural appropriation, but I think it's worth thinking about as you pursue it and then saying, if we're going to do this, how do we do it in a way that's, that's respectful um, and appropriate and not stealing op stealing opportunities. I'm not sure if that's the right way to talk about cultural appropriation, but but not uh, inappropriately borrowing things from a community in a, in a way that is extractive from that community as opposed to supportive of it. I would and I would just say I think you know and um, the the it's fusion cuisine, which um, even though I do like cushion cuisine, I was like. Is that a term that I don't know about? Um, so thank you, Janet, for clarifying that. Um, but I think, you know, fusion cuisine, I think obviously it's been around for a while. And I, I do think that there is just more, I think, grace in some ways. I think people are really open to this combination of flavors and cultures and bringing them together. Um, and I think you know, as our, you know, we've seen in a lot of research that there's just more sort of experimentation around what consumers are looking for as far as like food choices and, and what they're, you know, actually after. I think this fusion of different cultures to me is, you know, more of a celebration um, around, you know, bringing great things together in a way that actually, um, you know, sort of pulls out you know, different, different qualities and different cultures and different ethnicities. So I think, you know, to me, I see this as more of a trend um, that will continue um, and that, you know, there's more sort of grace given and less concern, um, just given some of the ways that these brands are, you know, able to, to sort of create that um, combination of flavors and, and sort of what that, what that brings to the consumer. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. You tested, you tested me on the spot. <laughs> I did not interpret it as fusion, but I was in the same place as you. Like, oh, my goodness, I hope somebody else understands term. I've uh, heard, heard a lot of new phrases these days. And I, <laughs> I yesterday, um, so yesterday our CEO was talking about stimulus checks, and apparently they're called stimmies by younger generations, which is something I had never heard. So I just figured that cushion cuisine was mm -hmm. maybe something new. And as I continue to age, I'm not with it. So um, anyway, <laughs> I, I thank yeah. you, Janet. I feel like yeah. I was like, there's something I don't know, but um, fusion is perfect. Yeah, that was a fun chuckle. Um, Gil asks a, a good question. Is it acceptable for people of color to draw outside the lines and cook, make, or sell food that isn't authentic or traditional, uh, but is fusion, same sort of topic we're talking about here, while if a, it, maybe making the same sort of fusion, right, that if a white person made it, um, that same product might be labeled as, a, as appropriation. Um, so is, is it okay um, for, for somebody from, from a minority background to to play in a way that it is not okay for, for somebody from a majority background to do. And I can start off on this, and, and if you've got a perspective, of course, add it. I do think that there is a difference, and I do think it's a, a challenging one and a tricky one. But again, if cultural appropriation is inappropriate use or borrowing or application of a, of a culture from a, um, a minority group by a majority group, then, then I do think, in some ways, um, the, the rules of appropriation are a little bit different. And, and what we're trying to do is be sensitive 
to to history and uh, and and to situations that are unequal and where there is inequity currently. And, and so I, I do think while it's hard to say one person can and one person can't, I think anybody can. We just need to do it sensitively. Um, and what we're trying to do with the whole topic of cultural appropriation is point out where where history may have put some people at a disadvantage and to think about how we enter into their spaces in a way which doesn't further complicate um, their situations, their lived experiences, their uh, opportunities in, in this world. Yeah, Eric, I think I would agree with that sort of perspective. I think there's, you know, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that while there in some ways feels like there shouldn't be a difference, I think there often is. And so I do think it is about sort of majority um, versus minority. And again, I think it's about um, sort of just being, you know, sensitive and appropriate within the realm of what's happening. And I, you know, I definitely agree with your point of view there. Um, I think that's, that's how I would have answered the question as well. Great. I think we're wrapping up. Is there another question that stood out to you, Melissa, that you want to grab before we got, maybe we've got time for one more? I actually wanted you to answer this one, Eric, which is, um, what is your take on local regional sourcing, supporting initiatives, and a transition to regenerative agriculture? I know we've covered this previously, and you have some, you know, great um, knowledge around this topic. Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, first off, uh, regardless of how I answer the question, I think regenerative agriculture is, is one of the most um, important toolkits for, for the tools in the toolbox for the food industry and broadly nutrition, uh, but also other parts of, of industries that rely on agriculture. So um, uh, clothing and other places, um, we really we really do need to be thinking more and more about how we can uh, better leverage uh, regenerative agriculture. As a method for improving our agricultural systems and processes, um, and and all of the benefits that come from that. So first and foremost, 100%, uh, we've been very intentionally are using regenerative in New Hope's uh, you know restated purpose and mission statements uh, because it is something that we we see as as absolutely critical to to the future of, of food and beverage and, and nutrition as an industry. I think continuing to get it creative about how we best bring regenerative products to market is also a real challenge uh, in the consumer packaged goods space. Um, the supply chains are strained um, and we are struggling to find, as an industry, we're tr struggling to find the right processing methods and, and ways of getting um, identity preserved regenerative agricultural products through the processing that typically is required to make a finished, a packaged finished goods product um, in such a way that we are you know, keeping that, that um, value add crop in the system. I think there might be some other ideas about how we do that, but one of the biggest challenges right now is the processing part of the supply chain, um, which will help us unlock both more consumer ready products that can be sold in the marketplace, because I think once consumers understand it and awareness is raised, they will see the value of this. But we also struggle to create the beginning of the value chain because um, it's a it's a it can be a challenging argument for some growers uh, to to convert to regenerative. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of reasons for growers to consider it. But also, if they think of it as needing to be a premium crop to to engage in, then they struggle to see the value chain all the way through the finished product that gets them that the premium they need. So there's something in the economics that we need to continue to work through and innovate through on the B2B side of this in order to make it really viable for B2C. I think ways that we can do that right now might be in the produce space, you know, and uh, in another less complicated sourcing that can be done very locally. Um, I do think that local supply chains might well be the ones um, that more are more readily available with simpler, less complex products as the places to start for bringing regenerative to consumers um, in that process. But uh, as a regenerative movement, we need, we, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle to be figured out as we do it. And, um, and we probably need as many as many tools and ideas in the process as possible to, to really make that one start to move in the way that it can and should. 
that was two and a half minutes on something that deserves months um, of conversation. <laughs> well, so. you did a great job, Eric. In the in the short time that you had, thank you for taking that one. Yeah, that probably about wraps us. This was a lot of fun as always, Melissa. It was, Eric, thank you. Um, if anyone is interested in any additional research um, around this topic, we at Suzy have that. Um, so if there's specific questions that apply to your business that you guys are looking to answer, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we will be back again soon um, with a new topic uh, in the next few months. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Bye, everyone.